skin to color the pain. That's why you know go come up for my mom. Forever I'm singing your praise. I fall up by, I fall on drop. Tick by tick by, if you know me say you came, you pay the price. All of the price, yo, go see cock 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 to the man. Now you get grace with me, you pour the oil on me, make me a king. These are the blessings with me, I they can't lie. Hey. Yeah. They bow on my complaint. Hey. Who's there? Who's there? Who? Okay, let me what do I know? Come to look at it. Joti, Joti, shake your troubles away. Money, go, go, Joti. We going out to the high places. Don't bring it low, give me my praises. Job you, David, my job you, David, come my better. It's you and I crazy, yeah. I will praise you regardless. Can't see my grandma, the ballet. Nothing above you, place, nothing above you. I give you a place in the air. Every day, Bolori, Yoko, every day. Lord, I will praise you, me, I will praise you, Koko, 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 every day, yeah. Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. I can define your love is something that's really deep. I'll be a hard guy, but I'm your low. You make me really weary. Crying like a baby, 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 oh, baby, baby, oh. Your love is too strong, oh, I can't deny this. 
need to call my mother and tell her that yeah, I'm finished. Every time I need you, I come, your love will come true. Leaves me crying like a baby, 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 oh, baby, baby. Your love has finished me. Just to look you, look you, look you. Your love has done me something. Just to look you, look you, look you. Your love has finished me, no, just to look you, look you, look you. Your love has done me like this. Just to look you, as you tell me, look you. Now you understand why I be say I can't do without you. Because you give me this and you give me that, and you be give me life and no be say na chance. Nothing we ever do go make you leave me dry. Oh no, your love is too strong. Go attend to my tears. I need to call my boss see and tell him that if I am finished here. Oh no, every time I need you. Your love is so strong, leave me crying like a baby, 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 oh, baby, baby. Your love has finished me, just to love you, look you, look you. Your love has done me something, just to love you, look you, look you. Your love has finished me, not just to love you, look you, look you. Your love has done me like this. Good morning, good morning, DCC. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing good? Get some energy. Clap for Jesus. We are here, and I'm grateful to be here with you all. This is our call to worship time, and here at DCC, we do this time where we kind of gather our hearts together and center on the reason why we're here, which is to glorify the Lord. So as I, we say, I was glad when they said unto me, and the church says, Let us go into the house of the Lord. We are here in the house of the Lord. I'm grateful to be here. And as we go into worship, we pray that your hearts will be stirred to love him more. Amen. stand with us. Did you guys know it's the last day in April? So uh, this is the fifth Sunday crew. And we're excited to be here. Um, woo! I just have one request and that, that is that you all will sing with us to Jesus today. So uh, whatever you're bringing in today or if you're just ready to worship Jesus, I just want to sing with my church family today uh, in a way that honors the Lord. It's clear to see, it's like the sunrise, faithful every day. Every breath I breathe, an invitation to believe that you're creating something good. And this season doesn't tell my story, and I know you'll move mountains for me. Clear. 
Yeah. 
confidence. You finish what you started. God, you have never failed. You won't start with me. You're present in every step. You're patient in every heartache. God, you have never failed. what he started and he started a great work in this baby right here before he was even born my God when God allowed for him to come into this world he was such a beauty when as he's grown he's grown into even more of a beauty and he touches so many people every single day and he's so free so free to be able to worship and to praise and to jump and to wave his hands however he wants to. How free do you feel this morning to believe that if the Lord says it, there's a reason to believe it, huh? Because he's a man of his word. He's a man that, listen, his word will not return void. It will not return void. And that's the reason why I believe it. Because he's a man of his word. Y'all, I believe him this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Y'all, it's time to move on because it's a place right there I could go, but I will not. We go take the kids on back to their space. We go let them go. So kids, because I know y'all patiently waiting to go with your teachers and they back there.
so at this moment, it's time to transition into communion. So while they begin to pass the element, as they begin to pass the elements and get ready for that time, we'll transition over. So uh, you guys can be seated while we pass out the elements. Uh, I'm going to kind of introduce our next song before we do communion, and then we'll go into communion, into the next song. But uh, this song is called Holy Only. It's a Travis Green song. We haven't done it in this church before. Uh, it's been really significant to me in this season because it's a song about remembering truth that has never changed. Um, even if we're in a place of uncertainty or a place of not knowing what's going to happen next, just returning to who God is. That's, that's the point of the whole song. Um, so if you'll follow along with us, like I asked earlier, if you would just sing with us, even if you don't know it, it's, the chorus is easy-ish to follow. Um, but this is just a worship song telling God and telling ourselves, reminding our soul, it's what, that's a line that sticks with me, as I remind my soul that nobody else is like our God. He's the only one who's holy. He's the only one who's worthy of our worship. So excited to lead you guys through it. Um, getting close. joy to be back. Um, I did an overnight flight with my daughter. I picked my daughter Karis up from her first year of college, so she finished uh, her first semester. And so real excited about that, and so if I walk in and I look like I'm doing this, it's because I was on a, I was on Spirit Airlines. I don't know if y'all know about Spirit Airlines. <laughs> that $44 costs, it costs. Alright, I'm just letting y'all know. It costs, um, but yes. And so, man, um, but I'm just so thankful. Uh, I got a chance just to read scripture while on the plane. And um, just so reminded of what Christ was willing to do and really excited about the sermon this today and also the sermon next week because it reminds us that Jesus paid it all. I think we forget that. Like there, the, the funds of his life were sufficient that there's nothing else that we need to do to be acceptable before the Father because of what our Savior did 2,000 years ago. In other words, he paid for our past, present, and future sins. And if you are excited about that, would you give God a hand clap of praise that you are fully guaranteed. And so we want to take communion together to remind us of the finished work of our King. Amen. And so the Bible teaches us that on the day that Jesus Christ was not only going to be betrayed by Judas, but he also was going to be denied by one of his closest friends, Peter. And he also was going to be abandoned by all the disciples that were a part of his circle. And so in the midst of all of that, he had a meal. And he says, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread and repeat after me. The body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us eat. Likewise, he took the cup which represented his blood, but not only his blood, but also the new covenant that we have 
in Jesus and how we are reconciled before God. So repeat after me, the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us drink. Amen. Let us continue to worship our King. If you guys could stand again. Yeah. 
stand alone and I stand in awe of your matchless power you are holy holy. can you guys sing that again with me nobody else can love me like you you're the only one I can do what no other God can you are holy holy nobody else can be who you are stand alone and I stand your matchless power you morning church. This morning we will be reading out of Mark 13 verses 1 through 37. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings? replied Jesus. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will happen and what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled. Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and he will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for it is not you speaking but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not come down or go in to get anything out of his house. And a man in the field must not go back to get his coat. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Oh, Lord. Pray it won't happen in winter. Pray those will be pray those will be in days of tribulation, the kind that hasn't been from the beginning of creation until now and never will be again. If the Lord had not cut those days short, no one would be saved but he cut those days short for the sake of the elect whom he chose. Then if anyone tells you, see, here is the Messiah, see there, do not believe it. For, for, for false messiahs and false prophets will arise and will perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. And you must watch, I have told you everything in advance. But in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not shed its light. The stars will be falling from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. 
Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. He can send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near, at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now concerning that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Watch, be alert, for you do not know when the time is coming. It is like a man on a journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants, gave each one his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to be alert. Therefore, be alert, since you don't know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening or at midnight or at the crowing of the rooster or early in the morning. Otherwise, when he comes suddenly, he might find you sleeping. And when I say to you, I say to everyone, be alert. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You guys going to have a seat? Guys, thank you for reading, Hans. Thanks for bringing up this uh, monstrous podium. Thanks for reading along. I know that it was long uh, and, and, a, and a lighthearted sermon today. So if you came for some encouragement, hopefully you will get it. Uh, we almost didn't have a sermon today. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had one of those weeks. This was like one of those weeks light for me. But uh, as I was prepping, there's a lot of nuance in this text. And I'd studied and all these things. And I'm like, yeah, but on Thursday, oh, it's going to be nice. I don't have any meetings. I don't have anywhere to be. I'm just going to have the opportunity to sit with God in my Bible and write this exquisite sermon that's going to wow the nations and everyone is going to sing my praises. I'm kidding. I'm exaggerating on purpose. But holding out for Thursday, wouldn't you know it, my wife comes home from huddle on Wednesday night and is like, man, I don't feel good. Man, something's really wrong. And I'm like, okay, all right, you need something? No, okay, I'm going to go to bed. All right, you go to bed. That's fine. <laughs> It wasn't very long till I turned my lamp off and laid down. About, I just fell asleep, and she's like, will you bring me something to make my stomach feel better? I'm like, sure. It wasn't very long after that. I closed my eyes again and laid down, and Brittany was sick for the next two days. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So all day Thursday, instead of being with my Bible, I was with my boys which is typically very beautiful. But if you guys remember earlier in the, in the month when uh, I had the opportunity to preach, <laughs> I talked about scarcity mentality. And let me tell you, scarcity mentality was on fleek this week. Do we still say that? No? Okay. All right. But life is like that, isn't it? You have these plans for how you're going to spend your future. And then unforeseen uncontrollable events crash your plans, right? They just ruin them. <laughs> and you're stuck remembering how not in control you are of your life. Life is like that. It's like that personally. And we ask questions, you know, we make plans. What am I going to do with this job? What are we going to do about these kids? Where am I going to move? What about my family? My parents are getting older and sick. What am I going to do? But we also ask these things societally, right? This isn't just something that happens in my own life. It's happening in the world at large. Culture, political unrest, all of these things are going on, and it can uh, bring about this sense of, strong word, anxiety, that we feel anxious, we feel uncertain about the future. We see things like the sin in ourselves or the sin around us. We see the injustice in the world. We see grief. We feel pain. And we want to say something like, Jesus, would you just come soon? Lord Jesus, please come quickly. Maranatha, right? 
But we could solve all of that if we would just know the future. Is there anybody in here who's like, I wish I could just know the future? All of y'all are lying. There wasn't one hand that went up. Be honest. Is there anyone who was like, I would maybe benefit a little bit from knowing the future? Is there a person in God's house that will be honest today? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm just kidding. But in that, there's something that I think happens, right? We want to know the future. And when we feel like, I don't know the future, I can't control all of the aspects, when we feel out of control, we like to take control into our own hands. Are there any con controllers out there, control freaks out there? All you parents in the room stand up. Not really, but like, you know what I'm saying. On Thursday, I was not, I will be honest. I will go first. On Thursday, I was not my best self with sweet Theo. Theo was also not his best self, but that's not the point. That's not the point. I was not my best self. Feeling so out of control, feeling so stressed, I, instead of letting Theo's big personality flourish and directing it and shepherding it, I tried to stifle it because I was so out of control. I will go first, I will be honest. And then I had to deal with that every minute with the Lord. You might also be a person who puts some contingencies on your faithfulness. You're like, God, well, if you'll do this, then, then I'll do this. Or if, or if I could just know this little piece of the puzzle, then, God, I could do all this for you. Like, I got it, I got it. Are there any contingency faithfulness folk in the house? No, 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 no. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. I saw one. I saw one. But don't. I don't want to out nobody. I bring all of this up because of Mark 13. Today I want to ask a question, and hopefully we will answer it. How can I be faithful to Jesus' mission when I don't know the future? How can I be faithful to Jesus' mission when I don't know the future? You could insert control there if you want. When I can't control the future. How can I possibly control my faithfulness when I don't control my future? Again, we're in Mark 13. We're still in this follow me series and I wanna walk through the mantra. We only have three more Mark sermons. So let's just land the plane on this mantra together. Disciples in the no, disciples on the go, disciples are faithful. That's right, okay. So that's our mantra and today Jesus throws some, uh, uh, some wisdom into the eschatology pot. <laughs> if you've never said that word, let's do it together. Say eschatology. Look at you. Scholars, academics, all of you. Eschatology is a term for the study of like the end times or the last things. It comes from a Greek word which doesn't matter. It just means last or final. So when you say eschatology, you're describing uh, a genre of theology where you're studying the Bible and what it has to say about the end times. Jesus speaks to that today, but he doesn't belabor the point. So what I'm going to give you is a reference list. If you like to study, if you're curious, then you can go throughout all of Scripture and see it everywhere, but I'm just going to give you a handful of places to go so that you can continue your study of eschatology, and then we're going to move on to something else. So here's where you can go. Daniel 7, Daniel 9, Daniel 11, Daniel 12. You could just read all of Daniel if you wanted. Secondly, Joel chapter 2 and chapter 3. Joel is sure you could read all of Joel. In Matthew 24, Matthew records this same Olivet Discourse that Mark has here in chapter 13. So you can have another example of this same passage. You can go to 2 Thessalonians, specifically chapter 2. You can go to all of Revelation forever and stay there, but specifically chapter 13. So if you took notes on that, if that's what you want to study, there you go. We can have more conversations. I give you that because Mark has a little bit of a different move than just talking about the last days, or the end times, or eschatology. Mark is more focused on how to be faithful than he is about 
what's going to happen in the future. If you want to know, what are we talking about today? We're talking about faithfulness. And I'm just going to package all of these ideas in three different moves. How many moves? Three. All right, here's the first one. Fix your focus. Say fix. (sighs) Wake up, guys. Say fix your focus. That's great. My, uh, My sixth grade soccer team didn't bring their energy all game yesterday. So I'm a little bit disappointed. So if I bring it out of y'all, just know that I'm referring my pain to you. Okay? Okay. All right. Fix your focus. In the first few verses of this passage, there's just a few things that happen that are very interesting. Very, very interesting. Mark is masterful. I love it. Oh, it's so good. In the very first verse, it says, as he, being Jesus, was going out of the temple. This is the last time in Mark that you will see Jesus in the temple. That's on purpose. And as Jesus is leaving the temple, which isn't just like geographically he is positioning his body away from the temple, Mark is wanting you to see that he has said all that he could say about the temple. And now he is handing them over to what they've chosen. If you guys have been around the last couple of weeks, in chapter 11 and in chapter 12, Jesus has come to Jerusalem And he has prophetically called them to turn from this fruitless, faithless religion that they have and to come into a faithful, faith-filled following of Jesus and his way. That is what has happened. And did they heed the call? No. So now Jesus, as a prophet, pronounces what's going to happen to this temple, and not just to the temple, but to Uh, what was known of Judaism at the time. Judaism still thriving, still alive. We could talk about uh, Israel and the church later. Amen? (laughs) Not right now. So, Jesus says, uh, or Jesus is leaving the temple, and then the disciples say, Jesus, look. Whoa, look at this ornate building. Look at how beautiful and big it is. And they were right to do that. Herod had been building this temple for like decades. It was bigger than Solomon's temple originally in the Old Testament. It was bigger than Artemis' temple in in Ephesus, one of the seven wonders of the world. So it's not just like the disciples are looking at a dinky thing like, oh, cool. Like it it was worth being wowed by. But they were missing the point. They say, Jesus, do you see this? And Jesus says, do you see this? And he wants them to recognize what he's been telling them, which is that it's fruitless. Beautiful as it may be, it's all for show. There's a reference there to Isaiah chapter 5, that God comes to his people and doesn't find what's expected of them. Uh, There is a, a story of a homeless man who was in church, like a gathering, somewhat like this. And someone approached the homeless man, and they were like, hey, we think that uh, before you come back, you should spend some time in prayer asking God what you should wear when you come to church. So they go away, right? They come back the following Sunday, and the homeless man is there again, and he hasn't changed his attire. Rolls up the same way. That same person comes to him and says, hey, I thought we talked about this. I thought you were going to pray and ask God what what you should wear when you come to church. And the homeless man says, I did. I prayed. And God told me that he doesn't know what to wear because he's never been here. And that is what Jesus is saying about the temple. And it, again, it begs the question for us, what are you wowed by? Or what are you working toward? Are you wowed by things that are flashy but they don't have anything substantive or substantial underneath. We live in a time that is very very much like the Gilded Age, very golden and ornate on the outside, very empty on the inside. And are we like the disciples, missing the point, chasing after things that look good but are not good? Are we working towards something that might seem good and yet it is empty? If that's something that might be true of you, fix your focus. But they go on. Jesus says this. He pronounces this judgment. And so later on, 
verse 3, it says, while he was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Again, Mark is showing how he is across. He's opposite from the temple. It's loud. The temple's in opposition to him. And they say, Jesus, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Those three things are pretty loud. Their posture towards Jesus is just like, hey, yo, put us on. We want to know, when is this going to happen? Rather than, hey, Jesus, why is this going to happen? Or what's going on? Or what do we need to do? Or how can we? None of that. They just want to know when. They just want inside access to Jesus and his knowledge. They just want a sign, which I don't know if you know this. That's what people would say to Jesus. Give us a sign. And Jesus is like, I ain't giving y'all no signs no more. I'm done with y'all. That's tough. But they're asking the same questions as the religious leaders. And so Jesus gives them an answer-ish. Pastor Jerry, your words. They got what they wanted, but they didn't want what they got, you know? He gives them an answer. He doesn't really tell them when. He just tells them more. Uh, but before he does... A question for you is, what are you wanting from Jesus? What are you asking of him? If all that we are after from Jesus is when to make certain moves with our career or what choices to make for where to put the kids in school or who am I going to live with next year or what classes am I about to take next or fill in the blank. If Jesus is like a, 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 the figure eight ball that you shake and get answers from, if he's like a genie that we just rub the bottle to, to get answers and wishes from, if there is more of a seeking after wins and signs and insider access to our lives and our choices, more than our Messiah who's called us and invited us into a mission that we get to participate in, then we might need to fix our focus. And then Jesus starts giving his answer. And it's funny, the first thing he says is, watch out. Say, watch out. The first thing he says, hey, look, y'all brought energy on that one. That's what I'm talking about. And I'm fine. But in verse 5, it says, watch out. Rather than talking about the temple, rather than talking about, you know, when this is going to happen or giving them signs, he starts saying what's going to be happening in the future. And he focuses on deceiving. In verse 5, he says, watch out that no one deceives you. He says... Many will come in my name saying, I am he, which is what Jesus says, I am. And they will deceive many. He asks the question, what are you watching? Watch out for your beliefs. Hold tightly to your faith. Make sure you're holding down hygienic doctrine so that you are not deceived. It's a similar word later that says led astray. And then he describes how there's going to be hardship. There's wars. There's the end that's coming. Nations are against nation and kingdoms against kingdom. Earthquakes and famines. There are all of these things that are happening. And something that I think is pretty important in verse 7. He says these things must take place. The word must there, oftentimes when it's used, is in reference to God's plans. So he's telling his disciples, look, when things seem a little bit out of hand, when things get a little shaky, when stuff starts to get a little bit questionable or scary. It's not like God is just out of control. It's not like God is just giving it over. This is to be expected. And I'll give you some more on that in a little bit. But my question for us is, what are you watching? What are you believing? If we are more focused on what's coming down the, the pipeline of our future than we are about holding tightly to our faith, then we probably won't do well with being faithful to Jesus' mission. We have to fix our focus. And Jesus focused more on the disciples' faith and faithfulness than what was happening in the future. Why did he do that? Because of the mission, which is the next point. If you want to be faithful to Jesus' mission, when you don't know or control the future, fix your focus and go with what you know. Say, go with what you know. That's right, that's right. Go with what you know. This is an entendre, so hold on to that idea. But look at it, verse 9. Jesus says, but you be on your guard. Be on your guard is the same as 
watch out. This term comes back like four different times. Jesus is wanting his disciples to see, to watch, to be prepared. But he's di- redirecting what they're looking at. He's correcting their focus. Fix your focus. But he wants them to go with what they know. This is, uh, this is fun. Jesus says that as they are going on mission, that they will be handed over. They will be betrayed, rejected. There will be physical pain. And you're like, you might be thinking, Ryan, I don't understand. Look at the end of verse 9. It says, you will stand before governors and kings because of me as a, what's that next word? Say it louder. As a witness to them. And it is necessary, which is that same word as must before, that the gospel be preached to all nations. So again, it is part of God's plan that the gospel go forth, that it go forward to all of the nations. Do you hear me? That is part of what God is set up to make happen, that the gospel would go. But here you see, you will stand before these people as a witness, and it's necessary that the gospel be preached to all the nations. So multiple governors, multiple kings. So there is this idea here that the disciples will be proclaiming, that they will be preaching the gospel, not these disciples, not pastors, not priests, not bishops, disciples. All of those who answer the call of Jesus to follow after me will participate in this mission. Are you tracking with me? You included. So there is this idea of being a witness or a testimony. There's this idea of preaching. And I say persecution accompanies proclamation on purpose. That word witness, the Greek word, is where we get our English word martyr. Which is maybe a tall order. But I feel like it needs to be said that most Christians don't experience persecution. Now, if you're on Twitter (laughs) or the news, you might see some folks who feel as though they're being persecuted. But Jesus said that you would be persecuted for your proclamation of the gospel, not for your baptized politics, not for your extremist views, but for the good news that Jesus is king, that he came to inaugurate his kingdom, that he went to the cross to show you what it looks like to lay life down, to take the punishment, the payment for sin, right? To raise again so that we would have power over sin, that we would have power over death, that there's nothing that could stop us, that even in death, that's a testimony and a witness to who he is to anyone, that's what it says here in the text, that our preaching that our proclamation of the good news of who Jesus is, is what brings about persecution. Again, not politics. So if you think that you need to be on some like right wing or left wing agenda to be persecuted, then please fix your focus, huh? go with what you know, keep it simple, and just proclaim the gospel. Are you tracking with me? Now, I don't know if we'll be persecuted in this culture for that, but it is highly possible. And I will say, if you've ever thought, man, this sermon's in my pocket, not this one, but a sermon, is in my pocket because we've been in Mark. I feel like I need to go share the good news with a neighbor or something. I need a, a coworker. Ah, oh, Randy, I'm going to go to the cube next to me. I'm going to talk to Randy. <laughs> Does anybody in here even know a Randy? Why Randy? Praise God. There's one Randy. In our midst, it's like seven points to Kevin Bacon or whatever. Anyways, why Randy? I have no idea. I don't know that many Randys. Okay, all right. Rando. Okay, moving on. But you go to work, and you're like, hey, Randy, I got a question for you. You want some coffee? I'm going to bring it to you. And then you just bail so hard. Randy, how's your family? Uh, Yeah, nice talking to you. Yeah, and just out. That fear that you are feeling is an acknowledgement that you might receive rejection from Randy for what you are about to share with him. That rejection here in the text is pictured. The hand you over, the uh, brother will betray brother to death. There's rejection here in the text. That fear of rejection that you feel is a part of the persecution that will come with proclamation. And Jesus says, push through. 
Be faithful. In the face of rejection, be faithful. So Randy this week, Beta, Randy's going to catch this gospel this week. All right? We all praying for Randy. Hey, everybody join in with me. Jesus, we pray for Randy. I'm just playing. Randy, next to you next week. I'm just playing. Okay. I'm being too goofy. Okay. All right. But Jesus says, proclaim. And if you're like, but Ryan, I feel a little bit nervous. What am I going to say to, to Randy? We all going to remember Randy for real. Goodness gracious. What am I going to say? Continue reading. Look at verse 11. Jesus says, don't worry beforehand what you will say. Okay, Jesus? <laughs> so just show up, and then what, you know? And he says, say whatever is given to you at that time. So I want to pause there. There's another reason, but I'm build some tension. We're going to come back to it. But he says, if you don't know what to do, say what's given to you. Just speak it. But I'm staying on this time, or on this for too much time. I'm going to move down to verse 14 and come back to that. Verse 14, this is probably the most fun part of this passage. The abomination of desolation. Again, if you want to study more about this, you can use those passages that I provided earlier. But some people uh, view that as interconnected with this figure who is to come, the Antichrist. There's also this, uh, in the scriptures, there's this kind of spirit of the Antichrist, right? There's this kind of ideology, this way of thinking, this uh, force of the enemy, something that is antithetical, that is a, a, one of Jesus' ops, if you will, right? Against Jesus. Uh, but this seems to be a, a personification of that idea, of that reality. Whatever your view on this, whenever you think this is, Hold on to it, all right? This, uh, just for reference on the difficulty of understanding this, this could have been someone who came prior to Jesus, but Jesus says it is to come. Uh, Josephus thought he was like a Jewish historian. He thought that it happened uh, a few decades after Jesus when priests were like slaughtered in the temple. Uh, someone else thought that it was in 70 when the temple was destroyed. And the Roman general, Titus, had sacrifices made to him. All of this suffering was going on. Whatever it is, it's probably going to be worse than that. I don't know what it is. I will just show my cards. You can do some study and see what you think. But I bring that up to say that is part of this great suffering that Jesus says is to come in the future. That there is this uh, hardship. There is this... I don't know of any other word other than what Jesus uses or the English translation, tribulation. There is this thing that is coming that will be so hard to endure, so ridiculous. What do we do with that? We go with what we know. You might be saying, okay, Ryan, what do we know? Well, look at Jesus' words. In verse 23, Jesus says, you must watch. I have told you everything in advance. I want to run all this back, starting with Isaiah 48.5. In Isaiah 48.5, the prophet Isaiah, speaking on God's behalf, says, I told you everything in advance so that the, the words that I've given you couldn't be attributed to any of your idols. God was out here flexing, like, your idols cannot proclaim the future to you. These gods that you serve cannot give you what I can give you. And God says, this is what's going to happen. And Jesus quotes that here. Jesus is equating himself with God. He goes on. In verse 31, he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away, which is quoting Isaiah 40, Isaiah 51, Isaiah 55. Jesus is equating himself with God. Jesus is God. He's saying, you can trust what I'm saying to you, and I'm saying it to you so that you're not led astray, so that you're not deceived, so that you don't follow any of these other false messiahs, these false teachers. A comfort, when I say go with what you know, something that you can know is that God knows and controls the future. How can I be faithful to Jesus' mission when I don't know or control the future. You can hold on to the truth 
that God knows and controls the future. Isn't that great news? Oh, you need more great news? I got you, okay? You could be asking, well, what's going to fuel my faithfulness? Jesus, in his wise, powerful, beautiful self, gave this Trinitarian, this three-person uh, of the Godhead encouragement here. In verse 11, he says, which I already kind of read some of, he says, it isn't you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. So, disciple of Jesus, asking the question, how can I be faithful to Jesus' mission? You can know that you have the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. That God's Spirit, the living God, who's over heaven and earth, who created everything, has given you his spirit, who is with you, and who will empower you to say whatever needs to be said at whatever moment. Man, that's great news. If that's not enough, there's more. That's okay. There's more. There's all this talk about, uh, I'm going to be proclaiming, but there's persecution. How can I be faithful when I think that I'm going to have to be persecuted? I'll give you an answer. No matter how hard what you face is, no matter how painful, no matter how terrible the suffering gets into the future, you can hold on to verse 20 when Jesus says, if the Lord, so this is the Lord Jesus, referencing Yahweh the Father, if the Lord had not cut those days short, no one would be saved. But he did cut those days short for the sake of the elect whom he chose. God will protect his people. No matter what you face, no matter what you go through, no matter how hard it gets, no matter what darkness is present, God will protect his people. I don't think you're hearing me. God will protect his people. Are there any of God's people in this place who would say, I'm grateful to know that God has provided his protection? That there's no enemy that I will come against. There's no friend who I think is a friend but who will hand me over. That nothing, there is nothing. And if I die, if I lose my life on mission with Jesus, even that is something that he can use as a testimony to his mission. And he's promised to take me body and soul into eternity. I am wholly protected. That is great news. And you might be saying, but Ryan... Then I'm getting wronged. Some, you telling me somebody killed me? What's going to happen to them? That's, that's terrible. I got a little bit more. In verses 26 and 27, Jesus says, Then they, who are future people or future disciples, which speaks to the fact that this would happen in the future, they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. He will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Not only do you have the Spirit's presence and power, not only do you have the Father's protection, but you have the Son's promise that he will come again. That he will come again. Now the first time, I think you know, Jesus came humble and meek. But the next time Jesus comes... He's coming not just to inaugurate to his kingdom, but to establish it. He's coming to right all of the wrong. Do you hear me? He's coming to take all of the sin and the brokenness and the pain and the grief, and he's coming to redeem all of that, to restore all of that, to bring justice to those who have had injustice done to them. He is bringing the kingdom. Do you understand? Isaiah 11 talks about how toddlers are going to like hang out with lions, I can barely let my son hang out with my parents' cat. That's a real story from two days ago. He loves when Boots says, I'm like, you love it till Boots gets you with the skibbity pat. All right, anyways. Y'all got Tony Baker fans in the house today. All right. It's the only thing you're going to hear me say from Tony Baker. Just kidding. Okay, all right. That was terrible. Okay. But Jesus says that he will come again in glory, in power, to make all things new. And you might say, but Ryan, I don't, I don't feel very seen. All those prom that, that 
presence and power sounds great. That protection sounds great. That promise sounds great. But I don't, I don't, I don't know how that helps me. In verse 27, four winds, ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. There is nowhere you can go. There is nothing that you can endure where God does not see you. God sees you and cares deeply for you and is inviting you to practice this steady faithfulness here in this passage. That's what Mark has been saying. Steady faithfulness is better than stances on future things. If these future things do not fuel your faithfulness, then these future things are not helpful to you. They might be some sort of a belief that you hold, but they are not an operational belief that you practice. Let it fuel your faithfulness. But you might be saying, if I don't know the future, if I don't have stances on future things, then how will I know when to be ready? You've heard the phrase, stay ready, you ain't got to get ready, right? Jesus wants us to stay faithful, so you ain't got to get faithful. If you want to be faithful to Jesus' mission when you don't know the future, fix your focus, go with what you know, and stay faithful, so you ain't got to get faithful, all right? There are two uh, kind of last parables, last little uh, images that Jesus has in this passage. There's a fig tree and a doorkeeper. The fig tree, if you're kind of unfamiliar with the last two chapters, Jesus curses a fig tree. He uses the fig tree as a, uh, an object lesson, as you will, for the fruitlessness of Israel. And we've addressed that with the temple. We've talked about that. But Jesus hearkens that image back. And he says, listen, learn from the fig tree. You can know when summer is coming based on the fig tree. You can know. There are certain signs that you can see. You can tell weather. You can do all these things. And Jesus is like, if you want to sign the fig tree, if you want to know when things are happening, the fig tree. Now, I would say Jesus answered (laughs) the disciples' question. They just didn't get the the answer that they wanted, you know? Because I would feel like, Jesus, you, 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 you gave an answer, and what you gave is helpful. But as a disciple, I'd be scratching my head like, totally, Jesus, what is this guy doing? What is he saying? That's just me, though. And the reason why I know this is his answer is because in 29, he says, when you see these things happening, and in verse 30, he says, until all these things take place, which is kind of the same structure of what the disciples asked in verse 4. This is the answer. And since this is all of the answer, again, this brings back the question, when Jesus comes, will he find fruit? Will he find fruitfulness in his disciples? He's calling all of his disciples all of the time to be faithful. And then the last bit is the doorkeeper. In verse 32, he says, that day or hour, meaning a future event, a future day, a future hour, not just a a time or a season, but an actual day, an hour. And he says, no one knows. Jesus says, (laughs) you could have led with this, Jesus. Jesus is like, I don't even know, man. I bet the disciples are like, what? This is preposterous. But uh, if that feels weird, what I would say is, Jesus, in his kenosis, Philippians 2, in his emptying of himself, in his taking on the limits of humanity, There were things that weren't for him to know. Just the Father. That's what this says. And Jesus says the last watch in verse 33. Watch. But then he takes on this new term, be alert. It happens four times. It's two different words, but unimportant. He moves from watch, from see, to be alert. That word is uh, stay awake. I think of uh, Childish Gambino now. I'm just going to leave it at that. You will see this verb again in the next chapter. So come back next week for more. I'm just kidding. But it says be alert. And that is what this idea of the doorkeeper is meant to communicate. Jesus says you need to be available at all watches of the night. You need to stay alert. Don't get caught sleeping. Again, Jesus is calling all of his disciples all the time to be faithful. There's the steady faithfulness that is more important than these stances on future things. 
The reason why I bring that up, again, if your eschatology is excusing your obedience in the present, then your views on future things are not helpful to your faithfulness, and they are not actually views on future things. That's some knowledge that you have that is not submitted to King Jesus, okay? Which is, you know, it makes sense because in our societal, you know, moment, we are so obsessed with the future. We care so deeply about what's going to happen in the future, don't we? I wonder what would happen if at Disciple City Church, we were a people who were so obsessed with being faithful. Like imagine, like think about it for just a second. We might study eschatology and know what's going to happen, but all of that bolsters us as we continue to be on mission with Jesus being faithful. That would be dope. And then when hardship comes, we would encourage each other. We would, we would admonish each other. Like, hey, look, we can do this. Let's go. What my sixth graders didn't do yesterday, we would do for each other. Hey, pick your head up. It's okay. You stumbled. You tripped. Get up. Let's go. We got work to do. It's okay. Hey, Jesus sees you. He's coming back. He's going to make all this right. Hey, the Spirit's got you. He's going to help you. He'll tell you. Look, the Father can protect you from this. You'll be okay. He sees you. He's not forgotten you. How can I be faithful to Jesus' mission when I don't know the future? Fix your focus. Go with what you know. Stay faithful. You ain't got to give faithful. And as the band's coming back up, the last thing that I want to kind of land with is this is like heavy and heady and cerebral. There's a lot going on in this passage, in this text, I wanted to make it simple with this idea of being faithful, right? Being faithful. And the last thing that I really want to poke at is what is driving you? Like what, what is your MO for real? What is at the bottom of your soul, of your motivations, of your character, just what fuels you, what directs you. Jesus is calling all of us to have the mission drive us more than anything else. Faithfulness to him be the, the thing that uh, helps us make decisions. And my question, that's just as simple as that. What does it look like to be driven by faithfulness? More than where can I get more money? More than where can I get the best house? More than the best way to express my personality? More than decisions that we make about sexuality? More than anything else, what would it look like for faithfulness to Jesus? Participation with him in his mission now and any time into the future, come what may, what would it look like to say, ah, that looks like a great offer, but I think it would pull me away from where Jesus has called me. Oh, man, that looks like a really fun opportunity, but Jesus has called me to be laboring here. Man, that would probably be really cool, but this is where he's got me. you're like, Ryan, how do I do that? How can I be faithful like that? Fix your focus. Go with what you know and stay faithful so you ain't got to get faithful. At DCC, we do a time of contemplation. We ask a few questions, things like, what is God calling me to stop? What is God calling me to start? What is God calling me to believe? And who is God calling me to share this with? So the band's going to play. We'll have a couple seconds to think through some of these things, and then we'll sing. And if you need prayer, if there's something that you're battling with, if there's something that's pressing you, if there's something, what you can come down here, and the prayer team will be here to pray with you, all right? Love y'all.
From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Please stand. All my life you have been faithful.
I don't know if y'all come from where I come from. Uh, this is a different key, and y'all are not ready. But Tammy, the one and only Tammy Lalua Coker is up here, and he could, Miss Terry's up here. I listen. I could do a lot of things because he lives. I could do a lot of things because he lives. You know. I don't know about y'all, but it don't matter what comes. Come on now. Oh, fear is gone. Come on. Because I know who holds, holds the, the future. So good. And life is worth all the living just Now. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and because of his goodness and his graciousness, one of the first clients that I saw was a woman who was recovering from cancer. She knew nothing of my story. <laughs> But she sat there as I was doing her makeup and she was telling me how she's not been feeling well, but she felt the push and the urgency to go back to work because she felt like that was gonna be what held her up and kept her going. And as I was doing her makeup, tears started flowing and I'm like, no, 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 don't do that, you messing up. But at the same time, I understood because she was full, not of emotion because of how bad she felt, but full of emotion because even though she was dealing with the Lord's goodness and his graciousness still allowed for her to get up and keep going, right? And so that was in that very moment, God reminding me that his mercy and his goodness and his kindness and his love is still running after me. And he met me in that place, in that very moment. Say that. And so I can do nothing but keep saying, Lord, in this moment, I surrender now. I give you my everything. Even in my moment of work, if I'm doing makeup with a customer who is dealing with cancer, who is recovering, I have an opportunity to share my testimony with her. Before it was all said and done, she said, God works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? Come on. Huh? God works in mysterious ways because I let her know. I said, you know, this is my first week back to work and you're my first customer that I'm working with hands on. Where I've been made to stay away from people for almost two years, but because of the goodness of God. Y'all, I was ready to tear Dillard's up, okay? Come on, come on, come on. But this is my opportunity and my moment to be able to share with you guys that his goodness and his mercy continues to run after us. Come on. Come on. As a witness, right? As a witness. So whatever it is that you've gone through can be used. 2 Corinthians 1. Your pain, some, your affliction, someone else's comfort, comfort like Miss Terry is saying. Or when you're going through it. So good. Thank you. Guys, thank you for that. Thanks for blessing us with that. Uh, listen, if, you, uh, if you're not in a hurry, we're going to eat together. Right out here on the lawn, picnic and prayer, uh, creation care, which is right now this event headed up by TJ and Zach. So guys, thanks for doing that. It's not just Claire in Jesus' name. But if you're hungry and you want to hang out or if you want some connection, if you want to hear more about people's stories and what they're going through, so hopefully it'll help you keep going, we'll be out here on the lawn. Uh, if you're a part of the family, then next Sunday night, digitally, yes, digital. we'll be meeting for a house meeting. We got a few things we need to talk about. Family, have family meetings to discuss family business. And we got some of that next week. There'll be an email that comes out. You'll get a link this week. I think that's it. And then for the youth um, parents that you receive the text message, um, our meeting will be in the back. This is an informational meeting and a Q&A meeting where you get a chance to hear what is going on um, for the next couple of months in regards to the youth. And also you get a chance to ask questions. So give it up for this brother for being obedient to the spirit. Obedient is a great word. Being obedient. Obedient is a great word. Being obedient to the spirit to proclaim your word. One of our favorite profs used to say, what in the world does my happiness have to do with my obedience? And sometimes you just carry that with you. Amen. I carry that with me. In Amen. Jesus' name. I got to do the benediction, right? That is correct. Now may the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit go with his people now and forevermore into the future, come what may. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hug go somebody to look, look like, like you, you before you leave this place. That's the low way go.
of your blood, daddy. I'm no longer a slave to sin. Because you did there for me. I no go fear at all. Oh, oh daddy. Is a putalamo. You have done it all over again. Oh. Done it all over again. Blood of Jesus, a mere worm on my head. Jesus Christ, yeah, a mere worm on my head.